एपिसोड 23 विद जस्टिन मैकलाउ सुमन वर्सेस सुमन आर यू अ यूट्यूबर और अ गेम डेवलपर लुकिंग फॉर हाई क्वालिटी साउंड इफेक्ट्स लाइब्रेरी zapsplat.com is for you download your sound now Dear friends I hope you had a wonderful weekend spending time with your family and friends So today this Monday I have a guest on my show he is Justin McLeod No doubt every one of you enjoy watching movies or TV shows or for that matter YouTube videos but have you ever thought all this sounds sounds of people walking sounds of cars moving on the road the traffic sound the sounds of the air sounds of the trees and plants moving where are all these sounds coming from and if you're thinking that all these sounds are brought into the movie by the music composer or the music director no no they are not who is behind these sounds and where are these sounds coming from actually So my dear friends let's explore more about foley sounds and foley artists Justin McLeod is a field recording expert he's a foley expert and he is a sound designer let's quickly welcome Justin McLeod on Suman versus Human Justin welcome to Suman versus Human Hello thank you for having me Justin I want to understand what actually this word foley is about So Foley is actually someone's last name who really sort of pioneered the art made it famous established the practices um so when actors are on set doing their thing picking up keys uh, uh trying to punch someone in the face uh walking down a road um that kind of thing um often they're doing so in a noisy production environment often the microphones that are covering them are not well placed to capture the subtleties of the sounds that we should hear so what happens is the sounds that you hear in a film or indeed on an audio drama are put in they are imposed on the soundtrack they are performed and this is done uh, by a team you have um the the recordist obviously uh, but you also have foley artists and this is a very, very a uh, skilled very specific job and what happens is the foley artists will watch the picture of the actors doing the thing and they will do it in exact time with the actors movements and in this way you can capture a very clean recording a very focused recording of the particular actions going on so foley refers to uh, a, a specific category of sound effect of which there are several uh, in a film that a- a- anything you see the actors doing flicking switches um cooking a meal stirring a cup of tea that kind of thing these sound ones that you hear are foley sound effects and the foley department will often have a great many props at their disposal different things they can use to create the appropriate sound effects at the appropriate volume um 
to to pro- produce the effect that the director wants. So the supervising sound editor uh, would be in charge of you know the whole sound effects department, and the director obviously above him or her, uh, um, achieving their vision for the film. Everything goes goes through them. So if we take, for example, uh, Lord of the Rings, um, a, a famous um, film franchise, if we take the character uh, Gollum, a rather unfortunate, uh, slimy creature, um, the Foley team performing Gollum's movements got their hands slightly wet and rubbed them against various surfaces like stone and so on so that Gollum's movements would sound wet and slimy and it's a subtle thing most foley sound will go unnoticed because it will be mixed low there'll be dialogue going on there'll be music going on there'll be other things going on but because the sounds are so commonplace they're the sounds we would expect to happen in daily life you know many of them we don't notice on a conscious level but we would notice if they w- weren't there the real talented thing the real amazing thing about foley is they're not happening in the common way they're actually being artificially performed with great skill at the right timing by other people after the fact after the actor um has done their thing so that's that's kind of an introduction into into what foley is and and what it is for and why the actors can't do their own you know the the actors sound effects aren't sufficient it actually moved me when you told me about uh, how this fully sounds are added on to the movies just in you know i just can't imagine because every small bit of the movie has some of the other fully sound like people walking as you mentioned cooking something putting the tea cup on the table i can't tell you man because it is not just one or two i'm sure there might be thousands and millions of sounds all over the movie that is a big hard work now my question is why it is been ignored when we look at any movie the names come out are director movie producer actors and many others but very 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 few people know about foley and foley artists why do so i think uh for the same reason but I, th- i think part of the reason is that foley is supposed to go unnoticed you know the art is kind of um shooting itself in the foot as it were it doesn't it's not meant to be noticed you're not m- meant to think oh the foley in that film was great wasn't it um you're supposed to just have it tell the story for you in a subtle way and so because it's supposed to go unnoticed people don't think a lot about it i think certainly historically i don't know if it's true today you read a lot of articles a lot of interviews with sound designers saying that the whole process of sound in films is underrated often uh, the sound department will have very little time to implement what they want to do often uh, directors won't give the amount of time that sound designers think is due to sound effects on a film so i guess films in particular are all about pictures right they're all about pictures and the famous actors and the story and the dialogue and so the sound which is commonplace in their everyday lives becomes commonplace in films and isn't really considered there are some 
exceptions to this. Um, the sound of Star Wars, not particularly the Foley, but the sound of Star Wars is highly praised. Um, and the sound designer behind it, Ben Burt, everyone talks about, you know, the sound of Star Wars because it was so I- iconic. It was so groundbreaking. As I say, not not the Foley particularly, but the unique sounds yes. that made the world come alive. Uh, but for most films, the sound actually just fades into the background. It's a difficult thing, right? Because everything has to be in sync. Like when the character moves, like when he takes steps or when he or she is running or walking, every step of them has to be aligned with the sound. Absolutely. Yes, it all has to be performed to picture. It all has to be synced up. And this, and that, you were kind enough to describe me as a Foley expert. Uh, I understand the theory of Foley, and I can record sound effects that can be used in Foley. But actually, Foley is a very specialized type of sound. But yes, it all has to be precisely synced. Historically, there was no, no sort of uh, computing or anything else to do this. It all had to be done manually. It's very time consuming. And I think one of the things that does get underestimated is the degree of acting skill wired by the sound effect department to make Foley happen. You've got to really read the mood of your character. How are they putting this um, cup down on the table? What should it sound like? They're not trying to to mimic the sound the actor made precisely with his cup on the table because often things don't sound real enough, bizarrely. If we take um, punches um, and if we take um, sounds of gore, so people being stabbed or yes. dismembered or whatever, um, in, in real life, these sounds don't pack the punch they don't sound um as interesting as we would like them to and therefore we have to make them sound more interesting while at the same time ensuring that they still sound real so there's dimensions on dimensions on dimensions on dimensions of this it all has to happen in precise sync with the actor's movements it all has to be performed with the intention, with the emotional impact that the uh, actors are supposed to have performed it with. And the sounds have to sound sonically interesting. They have to sound impactful. They have to sound immersive without drawing attention to themselves. You should never be thinking... And this goes for any category of sound design in the film. You should never be thinking, oh, the sound design for that was great, wasn't it? If you're thinking that in the middle of a film, the sound has distracted you from the story. It's become the center of attention. It's actually caused you to suspend your disbelief and brought you out of the experience to to look in upon it and comment on on the art. But what you're supposed the sound is supposed to be a part of the whole and then so that you know it's 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 a really fine balance to strike sound mustn't sound weak it mustn't sound underwhelming relative to the emotional impact that the um production staff are going for but it mustn't be noticed or commented upon it mustn't be too much it must seem like oh the actor made that sound of course the actor made that. you just put a cup down so of course you'd hear him put the cup down. It's no big deal, mm. um, but actually it is a very big deal. And um, yeah, Foley art is a very, a very skilled profession. Where do you get these millions of sound? Billions of sounds. How do you make this sound? Well, this is the thing for big budget Hollywood or uh, Bollywood or any other you know big 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 film. They'll make them. Uh, because no one slams a door quite like you. So I've got to make a unique door slam for you. Hmm. But these sounds are 
supplemented with, with uh, sounds from sound effects libraries. So these are sound effects that have been pre-recorded and then they are put against the action in the appropriate places. So many of these sounds are recorded. Many, sorry, many of these sounds are, are performed. They are unique to the film, but sometimes they will use sounds from libraries. There's a great example of this. Um, often, if you see someone break a pot or a vase, there is a very particular tinkling sound that is used. Um, and if you watch the films, you, you'll recognize this sound. And for some reason, there is only one large ceramic pot breaking sound effect in Hollywood, or at least that's how it seems. Mm-hmm. Don't quite know why. And, and that will be used to enhance the, the, the Foley artist's performance. So it'll still be put in in sync, uh, but it will be a sound that someone's recorded. So that's more where I come in in the sense that I produce these um, sound effects. Uh, this, is, this is one of, one of my jobs. Um, I produce these sound effects and I will distribute them to sound effect distributors like Zapsplat and Artlist and Soundly and SoundSnap and others. Um, and people will buy those and they will, ho- hopefully, uh, and they will incorporate them into their productions and this really kind of demonstrates the budget of your production how much of your stuff is pre-recorded and how much of it did you um create uniquely for your show and the lower budget your show is the more sound effects will be uh, pre-recorded how do you produce these sound efforts are they artificially produced or those sounds are naturally recorded it all depends on the sound so i was asked to produce a library of gore sound effects for art list uh, your listeners will hopefully not be surprised to learn that i didn't kidnap some unfortunate and <laughs> cut him or her to pieces uh, for the purposes of producing this library i thought that that would be quite inconvenient um quite uh, messy and so i bought a bunch of fruit and vegetables i spent a wonderful halloween uh, a couple of years ago producing this library um and i took things like watermelons uh, particularly watermelons watermelons are great and stabbed them and pounded on them with hammers and just crushed them and squeezed them and manipulated them all with a microphone very very close to them. This is the thing, you know, uh, Foley recordings must be um, as clean and close and isolated as possible. You don't want a reverberant Foley recording. You want it to be very, very dry so that you can put it into any environment you want afterwards. Um, so are they the real sounds? It all depends. If I'm going to get a cup, I'm going to put it on the table, then yes, that's going to be me recording a cup placed onto a table. And sometimes you are going to use sounds that sound like sounds. Horses on radio drums are a good example of this. Mm. Um, there's the classic trope of coconut shells being used for horses' hooves. That is true of cartoons and, and things like that. But even in much more serious BBC radio dramas, for example, the horses' hooves you hear are often not real. Uh, they're often made by props being banged on surfaces oh. in the appropriate way. And so what sounds are real and what sounds aren't is very difficult to tell. But there's another type of sound as well, where the sound is real, and this doesn't apply so much to Foley, really, uh, but where the sound is real but recorded 
from various perspectives. A car is a good example of this. If you're driving a car, what sound designers will do is they will take many different microphones and they will record the car from many different perspectives, including the exhaust pipe, tailpipe. They'll put a microphone on, on that. And they will mix these different perspectives of the car to produce the mood that they're going for. So let's say it's a car chase. Let's say there is some urgency to the scene in the car. They will bring up the, the channel with the exhaust pipe in it because that kind of has a, a growlier sound. Often, they will enhance vehicle sounds with animal sounds or fire sounds with animal sound or explosion sounds with animal sound. Again, in a way that we don't notice. Nobody wants to see an exciting car chase and hear a, hear a car go growling by and think, oh, yeah, there was a bit of leopard in that. No, that, 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 that's a failure. That is a complete failure if someone's thought that. Um but uh, you know these different perspectives and perhaps some some completely unreal elements mixed in make for a more visceral experience gunshot sounds mm. so guns are very 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 loud and so what sound designers will do is they will capture multi perspective multi channel recordings of the guns recording a good gun show is very difficult so they might have a, gu a, a microphone right by the gun and that will capture a very dry click you know a very dry uninteresting crack sound and then they might have um a microphone sort of 20 feet from the gun and then they might have another one sort of 100 feet away, maybe even facing away to capture the echo of the gun. And then what the sound designer will do is mix these perspectives together to produce a larger than life gunshot, which simultaneously incorporates all, all the perspectives in a, a way that is manageable within the mix so you're hearing all these different gunshots at once mixed together to make a hyper real gunshot and yes we're getting away from foley now um that obviously gunshot isn't the foley artist's province but they will do similar things they will use um bizarre props to make sound you are supposed to believe is something completely different as my uh, sledgehammer on a watermelon example uh, um, but gunshots and cars are, are the probably the most interesting examples i can think of of sounds that are at once real but not real at the same time i have also heard tire rolling sounds while car is moving on the road even the mud sounds have been captured yeah, oh yeah, you've got to capture the tires on the surface. Absolutely, that that's very important because the surface, um, anyone who's driven on certainly roads in England will know this, um, and I'm sure other countries as well. I say that because our roads are really bad. Uh, any you know, anyone who's driven on different roads in England, you can tell when you're driving on a good surface or a bad surface, you can tell the sections of a motorway that have recently been resurfaced from those that have not, just from driving in the car, um, because of the dramatically different noise it makes. So yet the the the, um, the wheels of the car are also captured the actual you know movement on the surface. So it's all captured and all mixed to taste um, by the by the next um, by the by the next people down the line. How do you capture the sounds of flights, aircrafts? Uh, actually, it's easier than you might think. The trick is getting clean recording. And this is something, um, obviously, that that's, uh, Hollywood, again, will be better at. Because if you are a big uh, film production company, you have a lot of clout. 
and you can say, can we please record your spaceship, NASA? Mm -hmm. As was done in Transformers, they recorded uh, the sound of a rocket launch from various perspectives. Uh, can we please record your weapons, um, mm. army base, gentlemen, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and people are much more likely to say yes. For the independent field recordist and sound designer is much more difficult. But I, ha I have myself uh, taken um, recording equipment onto a plane and wow. recorded it as best I can. Um, they don't, it doesn't make them comfortable when you do that. So um, I went to America uh, twice recently or fairly recently and I took my recording equipment with me in my bag in my hand luggage and every time going there and back and during some domestic flights I took while I was in the US um, I w was subject to a random search um, which wasn't random at all they were completely freaked out by by all the wires and all the microphones and all the everything. Um, but having established to their own satisfaction that there was nothing sinister about my paraphernalia, um, they let it on the plane and the, the uh, cabin crew were very good about it. They didn't bat an eyelid about it. And I would sit very still strapped in, of course, you know, adhering to all the safety portion, uh, with the microphone uh, gripped between my knees, between, between my legs, mm. pointed appropriately, trying to sit as still as possible and record the, um, the, the, the jet sounds. And some of those sounds can be found on our list and, and Zap's flat. Now, the, the disadvantage of doing it this way is obviously I'm sat with all the other passengers. If there's a baby crying, if someone has a cough, all this, you know, finds its way onto the recording. So they're not as clean as you might wish, uh, but they are still very usable in professional contexts. The cleaner the sound you have, the, the more versatile its application can be. Um, the, the less, like, so, for example, if I've got someone talking in the row behind me in a certain language, then that sound is only in contexts where hearing a conversation in that language makes sense. If you want a very quiet morning flight where everyone's asleep, my sound instantly becomes un unusable. If you want the plane to be um, flying in a completely different part of the world, um, then that sound becomes unusable where the language is inappropriate. So, so the more combined, the more muddled your sounds are, the less usable they are, but they mm. can still be usable. And yes, planes are um, very difficult to capture, but uh, it can be done. How do you make this kind of sound, like zoof, woof, all these you know, sound effects? Ah, well, now we're moving completely away from Foley to a category of sound called um, production elements. Uh, the cinematic sounds, they can be used yeah. for trailers. Um, they can be used, obviously, in science fiction and fantasy films to denote magic and so on. Um, these are the ear candy um, sounds. It's like... It's difficult. For me as a sound designer, it's difficult. Where do I want to spend my money? How do I want to enhance my library? Do I want a library of production effects? Brams and bass drops and whooshes and ascends and power-ups and impacts and reverses and swells and choppers and stutters and all these different categories of really cool sounding effects. But you do, you, you hear in all the trailers um, and, you know, things like that. Or do I want to spend my money on sound effects library encompassing one car or a sound effects library encompassing a bunch of footsteps on different surfaces? Mm. It's easy to go too much towards the production elements uh, side of things because they sound so sexy and cool. And 
not enough toward the doors and the cars and the footsteps. You can never have enough doors and cars and footsteps. I'm always finding I wish I had more of these sounds. Then not as cool and glamorous and interesting sounding to listen to but then that's not what sound effects are for sound effects are to be used and not to be noticed as we discussed um so you have to you have to remember that and and car sound effects well captured car sound effects because Mm -hmm. they're so difficult to capture because you have to have expensive recording equipment that will capture these multi perspectives at once. Often, a sound effects library will be devoted just to one car doing various things stopping, starting, moving at this speed, moving at that speed, passing at this speed, passing at that speed, driving over this surface, driving over that surface. And because it's difficult to capture, it'll cost a lot of money, uh, even, even for a sound effects library. Sound effects libraries aren't cheap. Uh, but, you know, just to give yourself one car driven by this one sound designer from all these multiple perspectives um, w- w- will cost a lot of money. So it's easy to you know, focus on the production elements, uh, which don't cost nearly as much money because they can be made by various different means. Uh, you can record sounds and then treat them in various ways, slow them down, speed them up, turn them backwards, add distortion, add reverb, um, all these kind of sexy effects that everyone wants to learn how to play with when they first get into audio production. Uh, that they're quite, they require skill to make, but they don't require um, expensive equipment to make. They don't require a lot of time to make necessarily. Um, they don't require a very quiet environment to record them in. So, you know, production elements libraries are usually much cheaper than, say, car libraries or really good gunshot libraries. Um, So, you know, you've got to balance your resources to get enough of everything that you need. Dear friends, before we go ahead, I would like to request you guys to kindly get subscribed to my channel if you're not done yet. Now, the interesting part of the show. Justin... McLeod is a visually impaired musician. I'm so amazed because being a blind, recording sounds on the field, you have to go through a lot of challenges. It's not that easy. But you proved yourself. You proved yourself. You turned to be an expert in field recording and sound designing. I am so eager to know about your life. So I've always been interested in sound uh one of my earliest memories is being given a red radio i have no sight but i was told it was red and i fell in love with it so much i can remember everything about it and this radio was able to receive uh on the shortwave band and particularly in those days the shortwave band was full not only of radio stations, you know, people talking music, etc. But ships communicating with each other and, and satellites and spies as well, um, uh, um, you know, sending their Morse code signals and, and whatnot. It was full of fascinating, unexplained sound, which I would just listen to for hours on end. Um, literally, I would just tune the dial and see what interesting sound I could discover next and this graduated to a love of recording and i would have this this fisher price tape recorder that i would carry around everywhere and record everything and i would try experiments what would it sound like for example if i recorded something played it back through another machine and recorded that now the interesting thing about this is this is actually um a tape used by professional sound sound designers it's called worldizing so you take a sound effect and you play it in a cave uh, or or in the environment you want to play it in and and so it takes on the reverb of the environment that you record it in and so um, 
you, you, this this is an example where far from wanting a clean sound effect, you want it to be reverbed. You want it to take on the environment of its surroundings. Uh, and of course, I didn't know anything about this at the time, but I was unwittingly mimicking this technique. And things carried on and things carried on. And I started making sound effects and little skits with no sound recorder when I was um, sort of 10, 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And then I started using Gold Wave, um, which is a, a free uh, um, sort of mixing program. And then I started using SoundForge, which is a, a not free uh, single track editing uh, solution. And then I discovered Reaper, which is a multi track environment. And I discovered that in 2015. And while all this was going on, I was filling in the hardware side. I read a wonderful book called The Sound Effects Bible by um, a famous sound designer called Rick Kavias and learned a lot of the techniques and crucially learned the equipment that the professionals were using. And I... uh, saved up my money and i bought some of this equipment i bought a stereo microphone and a two-channel recorder and i began to record stuff and it was very hard it was hard for two reasons it was hard to get to the locations where i wanted to record stuff so often i needed to enlist the help of my wonderful mother um who would take me from place to place back in the day uh, when I wanted to record stuff and, and position me in ideal locations and so on. Uh, so it definitely needed guiding, definitely needed, you know, pointing in the right direction, as it were, for, for some of the things. Many things I would record in my room. There are many things you can record around your house, and you can do a lot with that. Um, but, you know, for location recording, I would obviously uh, need help. But the other thing was the interface of this audio equipment was visual. It's very important when making any recording for any reason, as Suman himself has done before starting recording this podcast, Mm -hmm. to ensure that you've got your levels right. Too loud and you'll record something distorted. Too quiet and no one will be able to hear what you're recording and all kinds of other problems will ensue. And it's normal to do this by looking at your little display on your recorder or your computer screen and seeing where the meters are. And they will show you whether you're in the yellow, whether you're in the red, how loud you are. Well, I couldn't see those meters. And so I I didn't, I I had to kind of guess it, really. I, I I was fortunate enough that when there was clipping out, one of the two gain stages of my recorder, it would beep. And so that that helped at least a little bit. So if mm-hmm. it was beeping, that was obviously bad. I had to turn things down. Uh, but it didn't clip, at, it didn't beep at both gain stages. So it was still possible to have things too loud at another point in the signal chain. Um, so it was by no means foolproof. And many time-consuming recording sessions I had to abandon because they were too loud or too quiet. And this was frustrating. Then I moved away from the Fostex FR2 field recorder that I was using. And I was very fortunate to acquire a sound devices mix pre six second generation. And and this was wonderful because it used something or it, it had the facility for people to use 32-bit float recording. Wow. And I'm not going to get into all the technicalities of this, so, but uh, what just it basically in, means... I have a question. You know? So more the bits is mm-hmm. more room to record more sounds? Um. So 32 32- bit float recording works in a special way that I myself don't understand. So you've got 16-bit recording, 
which is standard for digital recording these days. You've got 24-bit recording. Now, in practice, in the field, if you want to avoid clipping, there's no difference between the two. If so you want to, to avoid to, distortion, to, 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 if you want to, to avoid... To make it more understandable for a lean man, I want you to simply explain what exactly is clipping. So, sorry, I, I, I thought I thought I had done that. So, clipping is distortion. If you record a sound too loud, it clips, it distorts. Mm. Um, and it's called clipping because um, the, the sound wave recorded by your device is literally, the top of it is literally clipped off. Oh. If you picture a nice rounded wave... Uh, with nice rounded curved peaks well what is happening if the sound is recorded too loud is they are these the peaks are sheared off uh, so you, the top of your wave now looks like a square the shape of the wave is completely changed and that results in uh, a, a type of distortion which is very difficult to reverse as, as I said earlier if you record too loud you get the distortion it's called clipping mm. now the more, more bits you have in digital recording um the better your signal will be in some ways but the difference between a 16-bit recording and a 22 24-bit recording is nothing at all in terms in strict terms of avoiding this distortion and it is crucial that we as any live recordists avoid this distortion. We avoid recording too quietly and we avoid recording too loudly. Enter 32-bit float recording. And the important bit of that is not so much the 32-bit. The important bit of that is the float. Mm -hmm. Floating point, that stands for. And that is a completely different way of turning your sound into numbers so digital stuff of any type is all stored as numbers and floating point numbers are different i don't understand how they're different and no one needs to understand how they're different to make use of it they are different in a way that means this unpleasant distortion this clipping does not happen oh. does not happen However loud you record, this is wonderful. This is wonderful for everybody, but it is particularly wonderful for the visually impaired recordist mm. because you don't need to worry about metering anymore. I go to any field recording session and I pretty much have my gain set the same, my volume, my recording levels set the same. I have them set fairly loud so that um, nice and quiet sounds will be captured. Uh, but if it's loud, if it's too loud, and I've recorded sounds that have been 40 decibels, or, or would have been 40 decibels too loud if I was recording using a 16-bit or a 24-bit system. But because I'm using this 32-bit float system, all I need to do is import the sound into my um, software and just turn it down by 41 dB mm. and you have a perfect sound. As long as your microphone is capable of capturing the sounds at that volume and not all of them are, it's important to know the limitations of your microphone. If you want to record fireworks with a fragile microphone, it's not going to work out. You're going to get that distortion at the hardware state. The microphone itself is going to distort. Uh, but if a microphone can handle it, so can your recorder, and so therefore can everything else. And so metering no longer becomes a problem. Battery level, you know, things like that. Yeah, I My Fostex FR2, great machine. I'm not trying to do the Fostex FR2 down, but there were certain accessibility barriers. Um, it would only last on AA batteries. It took eight AA batteries. It would only last for two hours. If you were lucky, two hours, two hours, two and a half hours, if you were lucky. 
So you always had to be worrying about the battery. I used to, <laughs> I used to, um, to keep these groups of eight batteries together. I used mm. to collect together all my odd socks and I used to keep batteries in these odd socks. And I used to go on recording sessions with tons of these spare odd socks full of ba batteries. So that if I ran out of batteries, I could quickly stop the recorder, take out the recorder, take out the batteries, put them in their sock, take out the new sock of batteries, mm. put them in the recorder and reset up. And it was so time consuming and fiddly and annoying. And knowing the battery level was so much more important. Now, a lot of these recorders uh, are powered from a USB source. So you can use a battery pack and you can get like six hours of recording time. So all these complications and considerations matter less. That said, I, I don't want to give the impression that modern recording is completely accessible. When I got my Mix Pre 6, I still needed sighted assistance to set it up uh, to do various technical configuration things. Um, but once those were set up, once I'd set it, for example, to always record a 32 bit floating point um, and various other things, then everything else is accessible then i take my recorder i take my microphone connect them together i make sure the sd card is inserted i turn it on i press record i'm recording and i can be recording if i've made sure my battery packs are charged and i usually go everywhere with two battery packs i can be recording for a considerable amount of time so my mind is uncluttered then focus solely on what i should be focusing on which is the sound i'm recording so it, it, it's frustrating um to and, and i'm sure if there are any sort of musicians producers mixing engineers listening to this podcast you know they will share frustration it's frustrating that the realm of audio is so visual it's frustrating to visually impaired people that the realm of audio in which they have a great possibility to excel is so visual and this applies in post-production as well when you're looking at um what frequencies your audio contains the spectrum of it the loudness of it it's, it's hard so you have to find methods to work around um work around these th things um but it has become a lot easier I recommend to any visually impaired recordist that they get themselves a 32-bit recorder or if they're a musician, a 32-bit interface so that when they're doing the studio recordings, the sound card can handle 32-bit float um, stuff. And, and, and it just it just becomes so much easier, so much less of a headache for anyone sighted or, or visually impaired, but particularly for, for the visually impaired uh, user. It's, it's the, definitely been the biggest game changer in my workflow wow justin irrespective of all these problems barriers challenges inaccessibility you have achieved so much that you have developed a beautiful library of foley sound team suman versus human salutes you for this achievement and also steam Suman versus Human salutes your mother for supporting you in your tough times. Now, we have come to the stage where I have this question for all my guests and you definitely have no option to say no. You have to answer this. Okie dokie. <laughs> so the question is, if you have all the superpowers in your hand to change something, in this world what that would be oh my goodness that is a very difficult <laughs> question um i'm gonna ramble for a minute while i like while i think about that uh, uh what would i change i think i think especially with and i think this is especially I, I think this is a universal thing i think it applies to any time and place but i think it's particularly applicable now, with the advent of artificial intelligence, which is a worry 
for creatives. You have, you know, the possibility that the music, for example, will can be artificially produced. Someone can just say, I want music that sounds like this. You type it into a box, you mm. get your music. You can even now, and it's it's very, very much in it in its infancy, but you can even now say, I want sound effects that sound like this. And they will be artificially created. Everyone is in a blazing rush to take as much advantage of artificial intelligence as possible. Why? Because they want to do it before the other guy. If they slow down, the other guy is going to get in front of them. The other guy is going to get the edge. The other guy is going to make more money. No one is wanting to slow down and think about the repercussions of Mm. this stuff. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I think artificial intelligence could be a great thing for for humanity as a whole, not just the the creative sector. But I also think things could go terribly wrong. It is going to change our lives in significant ways. It Mm. is going to change the job market. People are going to be replaced by AI straight up. They are. I don't know who and I don't know when, but, you know, the way we work is going to change. So what would I change if I had all the all the superpowers? I would increase empathy and I, I would increase trust. If we all feel for each other more, if we all have the ability to understand where we're coming from, where if, if I have a greater ability to understand where you're coming from, if you have a greater ability to understand where I'm coming from, then we care more then we consider more. Uh, And this goes for creating accessible technologies, accessible hardware, accessible software. It it, it applies everywhere, in in every aspect of life. More empathy would be a good thing. And if we trust each other more. Now, if I have more empathy, if I'm an empathetic person, I care about you, but I, I don't necessarily know that you care about me. And... And if you don't, then you're going to rush ahead of me and I'm going to lose out and you're maybe going to stab me in the back. So though I care about you, I can't slow down. I can't think we can't stop. And so to me, there's there's two sides of this equation. If I can trust you that you will do the right thing and you can trust me that I will do the right thing. And we both have sufficient empathy to ensure that we will do the right. Then I think the world will be a better place in so many the ways. And I think that is, place. you know, people have talked about AI should be taxed. People have talked about, you know, we should tax AI at a massive rate to make sure the governments are ready for the changes in the job market that there will be. The response to that is, is okay, I'm the United Kingdom. If I tax AI really high, then AI companies, they will just go somewhere else. They won't tax AI very high and they will just work there and we'll be no better off. No one trusts anyone else to do the right thing. So no one does the right thing. If I had all the superpowers in the world, I would increase empathy and I would increase trust. And this would make everybody's lives in and out of the audio industry, in and out of the creative industry, in and out of industry as a whole, just in life in general i think it will make everyone's life better that's a lovely desire i wish your dreams come true justin thank you so much for the very insightful conversation justin thank you so much for giving me this awesome opportunity to host you on suman versus human thank you thank you so much thank you very much for inviting me thank you